Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Self Helpless Podcast. I'm Delaney Fisher, and today we have such a fantastic guest. Um, Alex Catalano is here. Alex is the founder of the wellness brand Eat Cute and nutrition coach who has been featured on Good Day LA, Hallmark, TEDx, BuzzFeed, all the things. And Alex really generously opens up about her background, um, struggling with disordered eating and a lot of the things that, you know, were leading to that disordered eating. Um, she kind of talks about needing to feel in control of something and, and all of that and how she ultimately was able to transfer that need for control into something that was uh, very good for her and and beneficial for her health and all of that. So she talks about how you know she was um, struggling and then became a nutrition coach, and now she helps a lot of people um, heal from their eating disorders and and things like that. So it's a really powerful conversation. Um, if you feel like this may be triggering to you in any way, this might be an episode you want to skip or you want to listen later on. Um, and she just really opens up about all kinds of things. Before we get into the discussion with Alex, if you are an entrepreneur, if you have a business of some kind and you're really looking to scale your business without the burnout, all the burnout, all the overwhelm, all the hustle, the being everywhere all the time type of messaging is really not working for you. I have another podcast called The Minimalist Business Podcast. It's completely free, although it is a private show. It's completely free. You can get it over at DelaneyFisher.com. You can get episodes delivered straight to your inbox. You can connect it to your favorite podcast app, whatever you want to do with it. And uh, we talk about building and scaling a business with intention and really combating the hustle mentality and really focusing on quality work over quantity and all of that over there. So if you're looking to, you know, increase your revenue and also increase your free time while you're at it, I would love to have you over there. Um, again, you can find it at DelaneyFisher.com, completely free podcast. All right, everybody, here is my conversation with Alex Catalano. Alex, so excited to have you on the podcast today. Yeah, no, I'm so excited to be here. Yay. Okay, awesome. Before we get into all the goods, um, do you have a favorite or least favorite quote that you would like to share? Well, funny you say <laughs> that. I haven't pulled up my phone because I can't remember anything anymore. Uh, the <laughs> quote is, life is like looking for your phone. Most of the time, it's in your hand. Oh, oh yes. that is so good. Yeah. You're looking all over the place. You're looking outside of you, but life is in you, baby. That's what I believe. Like at least for <laughs> myself, a lot of times I look outside myself for the answers. And I'm like, if I just sit with myself for a minute, I know the answers. I just need to yeah. empower myself to believe them. I love that. We talk so much about self-trust on this podcast and it's so true. It's like, once you stop looking to all the external factors or even just like external validation of what you should do or shouldn't do it kind of becomes a lot easier to like actually move forward when you just kind of consult yourself as, you know, the top advisor of your life. Agree. I mean, because especially now with social media, it's like, well, what's this person or what's this person doing? I think it's become kind of second nature now to like see what everyone else is doing as opposed to checking in with ourselves first. So I'm like, huh, simple, but powerful. No, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, let's, let's get right to it. Shall we? Let's. I'm going to start off with some, let's just get right into the tough stuff. Let's get right into it. <laughs> let's skip on the fluff. Okay? You're like, this has been fun, but let's talk about your eating disorder. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough social media talk. Let's move it on. But yeah, if you don't mind starting Alex, like when did you develop disordered eating? How old were you? What did that look like for you? What was going on in your life? Yeah. So this is interesting. Um, it's so wild. So I grew up, um, in Los Angeles where, you know, there's a lot of pressure. Yeah. And, um, I went to this, um, 
junior high school that uh, had a lot of celebrity kids in it. It was this private school. And not to brag, but it's a gentle brag. Uh, I went to school with the Olsen twins who are very thin. Oh, and wow. a lot of the girls were very thin there. And so that kind of caught my eye a lot, just seeing like the popular girls tend to be very thin. Mm. And this is not a, you know, I have no anger about it, but growing up, my, my mother was very um, involved in my food and was always commenting on my body and my weight. And I noticed that she would say I looked pretty when I was thin. And so these kind of things started to come into play when I was in seventh grade. So I was probably like 14. Um, And then I ended up going to USC for college and I was in a sorority (laughs) And then I really started to see that kind of really manifest manifest itself into some eating disorder tendencies, you know, writing down everything I ate or throwing up my food um, or just being very neurotic about what I was eating, whether I was starving myself or binge eating. And this kind of relationship really kind of took hold during my college years. Wow. Okay. So what I mean, I, I'm not as familiar with all the different classifications of eating disorders. Did you get like, um, a a certain diagnosis of what you were experiencing or was it like a mix of things? Was it bulimia, anorexia? Was it, it was a mix of things. And it's interesting now that I've talked to people about it, you know, I'm 37 now, so time has passed, but now that I've talked to people about it, it looks, it kind of transforms in different ways, at least for me, you know, it first started with, you know, very restrictive dieting where I was like, you know, not eating anything and then just kind of binge eating. And then I kind of was uh, dabbling into, well, look, I can eat what everybody else eats. I'll just go throw it up. And then I don't have to like worry about, you know, I can still participate and eat what everybody else eats. So for me, it kind of fluctuated between both. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And did anybody know that you were struggling with this? Was this something that you kept to yourself? What did that look like? And was there like a pivotal moment where you realized that you had a problem and you needed some help? Yeah. Um, nobody noticed. Uh, I think uh, what I, what I see, especially when I coach people, a lot of times that have eating disorder habits is like, it's very secretive (laughs) and we're very good about keeping it a secret unless, you know, a lot of times when someone has anorexia or they get very, very, very thin, then it's very noticeable. Or you see, you know, there's stains on their teeth or, um, just, you know, very neurotic behavior and you can kind of pinpoint it, but where I was, I would just be very secretive about it. Um, mm. and no one never really knew. And I didn't really start talking about it until I had healed my relationship with food. I honestly didn't even realize I had one. I thought it was just kind of, it was just something I did. Wow. So you had, you're like, this is, what was your mindset? Was your mindset like, and eh, this is just like a temporary thing I'm going to do or try, or I'll just do it every once in a while. Like what was going through your head that kind of justified that it wasn't an eating disorder? Yeah. Um, I guess for me, when I was in college, it's just, I always wanted to look a certain way. And I just felt for me, you know, I tried so many different things and it felt like that was the one thing that like I could count on because you know, it's interesting with eating disorders, it tends to, you you know, you think it's about like an outward appearance, but it's actually a result of what's going on inside. And it has to deal with, you know, control or feelings of sadness or self-hate or not enough. And so it was really a deeper issue. Um, But I think it was manifesting itself in in the way that I, you know, in order to gain re-control of my life or things, I used food in some way. Yeah. So, what was like, was there a certain moment or progression for you where you stopped, um, you know, binging and purging or limiting food? Like what did, what did that look like after? Yeah. So that's interesting. Interesting. So when I was in college, I was dealing with this throughout college and I was actually studying to do opera singing, which (laughs) now is just, you know, really expensive karaoke lessons. So (laughs) whoops. And <laughs> might have, to have you sing some opera just so yeah. you can, hey, want to want to sing for thousands this, and thousands of people today? <laughs> yeah, this is this is a sixty thousand dollars worth of uh, singing lessons. You're welcome. Uh, so um, for me, I had gotten to the point where you know my throat was so raw from throwing up all the time. I was exhausted because I had no nutrition, and I just started performing really poorly in college. And it got to the point 
where I wasn't, you know, not, I wasn't doing well in my music classes, which was devastating because that's what I was there to do. Mm. So I ended up transferring my major to communications, graduating. And once I graduated, I didn't really want it. I didn't really know what to do with my life because my life purpose was music. And then I was like, I don't know. And I started working at this restaurant as a server and I started to see how different people eat. And I became friends with a lot of um, the staff there. And one guy in particular was really big into holistic nutrition. And I didn't know what that was. And he was very interested in the power of food. And I'd never really thought about it like that. And so he gave me a lot of books and I started reading and learning. And I just kind of fell in love with nutrition. And I thought, this is so interesting. If I want better skin, like these foods can help me get it. And so I started to kind of recalibrate my idea of like what food was and not think of it as a bad thing, but maybe as something that could be helpful in my journey. Yeah. And from there, I ended up falling in love with it and going to nutrition school called integrated nutrition in New York. And I really started to see food differently where I started saying like, Oh, instead of being like, this is going to make me fat. It was like, this is a cucumber. It's rich in uh, caffeic acid and it, it can do this and this and this for you. And I started to see all the positive things that food could do. Yeah. And that's kind of what turned the tables for me and helped me um, start to see food differently. And then I started to realize through my nutrition schooling, I was like, oh, I had an eating disorder. Wow. So you didn't even realize until you were like in nutrition school that you had an eating disorder. Yeah. And I think it's interesting. I, I can't compare it to anything else because I grew up in LA, but I was in a sorority house and I lived with 60 different women. And I saw a lot of different ways that people ate. I saw a lot of women on restrictive diets. I'd see some girls like we'd get like this, we'd sit all down for dinner together. And I'd see some girls take salt and pour it all over their food to keep them from eating it. I saw all different yeah. kinds. Yeah. Wow. I saw a lot of different ways of eating. And so at the time it, it didn't see that seem that crazy. Now I knew, I think internally somehow I knew like I, I was awfully, obviously shameful about it. So I wasn't telling people. Um, but I just saw a lot of people with a bad relationship with food. So it kind of became normalized in some way. Yeah. Oh, wow. Did, okay. I'm trying to think. So the fact that you mentioned that your eating disorder at the time was really more about like the control that you felt that you had, or, or there was some other internal feelings. Do you feel like you were able to like, kind of in a way, healthily transfer, transfer that control to something else? Like <laughs> you kind of still need the control over something, but now it's the control of like, how much healthy food can I get in me? A hundred percent. Like so I, I always tell people, it's not like I'm walking around like, look at me. I am a cure. Like I am a type a person. I like to know <laughs> like I I'm controlling, but you know, I try to take that part of my personality and use it to get addicted to things that will serve me, whether it's in my business or in my life or in my career. And I'm a little bit more mindful about what I like to, you know, really mm -hmm. <laughs> controlling about. And yeah. that's something I'm working on. I'm learning to let go a little bit more. And that's been a real challenge, but at least I've gotten that away from food and, and that kind of behavior. Oh my gosh. I completely resonate with that. That's why I asked you because you know, <laughs> my background is like, I was a major workaholic. I don't even think I realized how big of a problem I had until I was out of it but my workaholic tendencies are still there. I still, it's like a daily battle of like wanting to compulsively work yeah. and choosing to do something else with that urge instead. So now I like, I channel a lot of my workaholic tendencies into things that are good for me where it's like, okay, how can I use this energy to like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to set up a bunch of appointments on my calendar that, um, you know, for massages for this next month, you know, it's like, I, I channel all that and like, okay, let me get a meal delivery service. I, I I'm still kind of <laughs> in yeah. a way I'm a little bit compulsively working in one sitting, but I'm yeah. doing stuff that actually promotes so much rest and health and all of that. And that's how, that's really the way that I've been able to kind of switch things. I can't stop that part of myself very much, yeah. but I could like leverage it for something that's much better for me. And so I was so curious about how you manage that. Um, yeah, no, it's, um, it's still there. And, you know, for me, again, I'm very resident, resident to say this, um, reticent to say this, but uh, like for me, especially with my eating disorder background, 
calculating my macros has actually been quite helpful for me. Like I know for some people you can get really crazy and intense and it's like, if you don't follow it perfectly, like your whole life falls apart. And if you're somebody like that, I would not recommend it. But for me to know that I should hit a certain amount of calories, a lot of us, especially with eating disorder things, we don't eat enough, you know, we're just, we're like reticent. So being able to be like, I need more protein. I need more um, carbohydrates. It's okay. And just kind of like planning for it and just knowing like, or especially like, Oh, I'm going to have pizza you know, I can plan for it and know that I'm not going to go off the rails because I've planned for it. Um, and so using a macros calculator, like my fitness pal has been wonderful for me, but for some of my clients, it's like absolute worst. So it's yeah. just kind of figuring out what works best for you. Yeah. That's so interesting that it could be really triggering to somebody who's oh, super triggering. with an eating disorder. And for you, it's actually helpful. It makes you probably eat more and yeah. of under eat. So how do you manage that? I mean, the fact that you have a career in the health and wellness space, so much of your day to day revolves around eating and exercise and like the relationship you have with food and exercise and your body. How do you stay on the healthy side of that line? Like, do you ever feel like you're dipping back into old patterns and like, how do you pull yourself out and keep you on that? other side, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's so interesting. I was thinking about this the other day and I just feel like for me, I really love what I do and it doesn't feel triggering to me because I feel like I took this deep pain that I had and I've turned it into purpose Um, and it just makes me feel like uh, for me, when I'm coaching um, people, clients that have eating disorders, like for me, when I know exactly how they feel, I know exactly, you know, some of the tendencies they have and to know how I've been able to transform my life and give them some insight and help them in some way really like makes me feel alive. Like I absolutely love it. And, um, yeah, I, you know, for me, I don't feel as triggered as much. I've really (laughs) food and I had such a bad relationship and I just, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but when you change your diet and you start to feel like so energized and good, like a lot of times food has to do with our mood and our uh, emotional wellness. Yeah. Uh, it's just, I feel so differently about food than I did, you know, when I was in my early twenties that for me, it's even hard to remember that t- like a time when I felt like food had power over me, but yeah. Um, yeah, I don't feel triggered in that way anymore. I do know that my, you know, and I say this about a lot of women and interesting enough, uh, men too, a lot of men deal with, um, eating disorders. Um, you know, it's just, it's, um, it's about control and it's about, you know, some, some issues in our lives that are unresolved in other places. And it kind of manifests ourselves in, in the food thing. Cause that's the one thing we can control. We can control what we eat every day. Totally. Yeah. That, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. And I, completely resonate with what you said about how you help your clients. Cause I feel that way too. It's like, I, I almost feel like, Oh, I, I had to kind of experience that really hard period of time because now I feel like I'm on the other end of it and I can yeah. help other people who are struggling with that and try and, and support them as they pull themselves out of that as well. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, are, would you be willing to kind of share about what else was going on at that time? Cause you mentioned it's about, out, about, um, control. It's, a, it's, it's about, you know, how you feel internally, you know, maybe there's some like self-loathing or something going on. Um, do you, would you mind sharing a little bit about like what the internal struggle was for you? Of course. Yeah. I would be happy to. I mean, for me, it just, I felt like I was in a situation where, you know, the pretty girls were the thin girls and the ones that were popular were thin and just got a lot of recognition from guys. Um, you know, in terms of my family, like my mom was like, likes me when I'm small, like she to this day and I love her and we've talked about it. I mean, the other day she just made a comment about my weight, like this is ongoing and that's, I can look at it now and say like, Oh, okay. Like that was her issue or she has some things going on with her. Right. But yeah, I just feel like, you know, I was, I just put a lot of worth self-worth on like my appearance. And I just felt like, I just was so frustrated because I wanted to look so badly, like a lot of these other girls, but I I have to realize like, we all have different body types and different fit ranges. And, you know, I just, at the time I'm 37, (laughs) curvy things like curvy wasn't a thing. I mean, Kim Kardashian was, I don't even think that was a thing yet. Like thin, lean, bodies were in. 
And it was so hard to achieve that. And I think now I hope that things are changing where we're seeing images of people with different body types and seeing that you can be beautiful no matter what your body type is and, and having those people um, as role models for others, I think is so beautiful. Yes. Oh, could not agree more. Yeah. Well, it's just interesting. I mean, I, I do not know what you looked like at that point when you were struggling with this. Um, but you, I mean, you're a very petite person and so Four foot 11. right. Like, <laughs> right. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, we're, was there a disconnect? Were you like objectively like p- petite, let's say, and still feeling like you were not reaching this kind of this, this unattainable, you know, I don't know, level of, of thinness or whatever you were trying to achieve. Like, was there a disconnect with how other people saw you or what was going on? Oh, there's on? a huge disconnect. And I think a lot of people with eating disorders, like we see ourselves in the mirror very, very differently, or mm-hmm. we really focus on this one part that we don't like. And that's all we see. Um, yeah. And at least for me, it's like, I just, it kind of touched everything. It's like, well, I can't wear that dress cause I'm not thin enough, or I can't buy this thing until I lose this weight or, I, you know, I need to be this size. Yeah. And it's really hard. Like I, my natural body type, I'm four foot 11, but I'm curvy. I'm Italian. Like I have a big, <laughs> a big butt, like <laughs> no matter what I do, like that's yeah. my butt. Like it's, and it's hard. Cause sometimes, especially for me at the time, social media didn't exist. And I can't even imagine what that's like now to see social media and, and be a young person, but you know, my role models were celebrities and magazines and I desperately wanted to look like those girls in the magazine. And I just, you know, I couldn't achieve it. It was impossible. It's impossible. My body doesn't look like that. Right. Okay. So really like your internal stuff going on was, was you wanted to achieve something in order to get some kind of validation or approval or love, not only at school, but at home, potentially just how you were processing it. Yeah. I was processing it. Like, you know, I want to be pretty. I want to be desired I wanted because growing up I was never really popular in school I was this nerdy little quiet weird kid and I still am now but <laughs> <laughs> I cared so deeply about what people think and I, I felt like I remember the first time this is so weird I lost some weight I was in seventh grade and one of the Olsen twins came up to me and she's like you look good you lost weight and I was like oh like people mm-hmm. like it when you're thin and then I noticed when I lost weight guys would start talking to me more or you know Wow. At least that's how I, I felt like I got a lot of positive reinforcement for being petite or thin, or maybe I just wore less clothes because I was feeling better and people noticed it more. And that's how, what made them compliment me. But in my mind, you know, thin equals pretty people like you, you have friends, you become popular, you get a boyfriend, like my mom loves me. It just felt like a lot of my self-worth and being accepted by others was really wrapped into my weight. Oh gosh. It's, it's so hard because like, we all know logically and objectively how messed up that thinking is, but <laughs> it was getting validated. Oh, like, 100%. It was, like, we know like that's so fucked up yet externally you were getting approval for that and you were being treated differently for that. And that's, what's so messed up is that it's just such a, it's a systemic issue. Not only, you know, individually you're internalizing things, but yeah, it's how like everybody has to treat this differently for things to really, really change. Yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. I, um, I, it's so interesting. Cause I, you know, I, um, I struggled a lot with how I looked and I, I always felt uncomfortable bringing this up into a conversation because I, I was worried about the judgment of people who I felt struggled more than me, but I was always very, very thin, um, Mm. like really thin to the point where I didn't feel beautiful being that thin because then I started hearing a lot of messaging like, oh, real women have curves and all that stuff. And then you feel like, well, I'm naturally thin. So now I feel like shit about what my body looks like. And I, you know, I, didn't have a uh, boobs or a butt or anything like that, you know? So I, um, I actually tended to do a lot of overeating, um, it throughout my life because I'm like, well, I could 
I could stand to gain a few pounds and hopefully it gains it in the quote unquote right places. Right. Which is, you know, yeah. it's like, yeah, it's just like kind of, you know, you could be experiencing all of that no matter kind of what your body type looks like. And it's just so heartbreaking. It it's really so works. heartbreaking. And I've been, it's so interesting. I did a post about it on my Instagram not too long ago and I was so shocked. Like a bunch of dudes wrote me, they're like, I felt like this. I was like, really? And I was like, I thought about it. I was like, I guess guys don't have a platform for it, but either you're a guy and you're really thin and it's so hard for you to put on muscle and you just feel really bad about your body. Cause you can't, you know, bulk up or, you know, I know some guys that just couldn't lose the weight and it's just, we're all dealing with it. And I think honestly, one of the things that gives you your power back is talking about it with others and being vulnerable and opening up because eating disorder behavior tends to make you want to shut down and be really private and secretive about it. But I found that talking to people about it, it's like, Oh my God, I had the same experience or I felt that way too. Or, Oh my God, no, I didn't mean that. You know, you look great no matter what size, but I think we kind of create these narratives in our head about, Oh, what I'm like for me, my narrative was like, Oh, look, when I'm pretty, I get compliments, but maybe it was just me being like, I'm thin. I feel good now. And I'm exuding that to the world. And they're seeing that people are going, you look great. And I'm going, see, like, oh, interesting. It's yeah. interesting. Cause it's like, I would wear a bathing suit if I thought I was really skinny. Interesting. I don't know. I don't know. But I think talking about it really is important. Definitely. So when you started getting really into nutrition and that kind of became like your new thing, did you feel like your disordered eating just kind of, it, it just kind of transformed it itself? Did you have to actively try to stop it, some of those behaviors or like, what was that transition like? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it the way I did it for, for my clients, but you know, I, I was like, I'm going to handle this myself. But for me, the way I did it was I just became so excited about food when I went through nutrition school that yeah. I just stopped being afraid of food. And I felt like knowing about food and knowing what it was doing for me and, and seeing all the health benefits really gave me the sense of I'm doing air quotes control that I wanted, where I was like, Oh, I can craft and create a diet just for me to make me feel great. Yeah. Um, so that was one of the things, but for other people, I always say, um, you know, invest in either talking to a licensed therapist or a dietitian or a physician, a physician and getting help. Um, and, you know, be patient with yourself. I think a lot of us just want to heal overnight, but with eating, eating disorder behavior, I think a lot of times it stems from other issues, you know, yeah. and we use food as a method to control and, and gain control in our lives. So being patient, taking the time, not keeping it a secret, um, yeah. and, and just being mindful and, and, and kind to yourself. Cause I think a lot of it comes from this feeling of like, not self-worth. And for me, my triggers were feeling like, Oh, a guy rejected me. I'm obviously not skinny enough. That was like always the thought in my mind is when I'd see those feelings come up. Oh, wow. Uh, but knowing about nutrition and, and really like for me, fitness has become such a big part of my life and realizing like our bodies are like cars. It needs fuel to run. I'll have a better workout and be able to get more toned if I have good nutrition. Mm -hmm. And so I always just keep that in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So yes. And I totally agree. You know, I I'm sure a lot of people have a story like yours where they kind of just like, it was a secret and then kind of stayed a secret. And then they kind of figured it out behind the scenes. And then there's a lot of people that went to the therapist or inpatient or outpatient um, type of program or something like that. Could you give us like a little snapshot almost about, let's say that you're sitting down for a meal now, you know, yes. after years of, of, of um, thinking differently about food and your body and all that, what did you, what kind of, uh, thoughts did you used to have when you were in your like disordered eating pattern and what kind of thoughts do you have now? Like when you're eating or you're about to eat, like, have you noticed like a big difference in this mindset? is a fantastic question. I'm so excited to answer it. So for me, I had a very shameful relationship with food. So when I used to eat, I was always eating quickly and been like, especially when, when I lived with my parents, I just felt like my mom was always going to come in and criticize me. So I used to eat in front of the fridge quickly, or, you know, I was just shameful about eating now. And I say this to people, whether you have an eating disorder or not, you sit down, you make, you put it on a nice plate, get a cute little napkin. Like you create a moment, like this is a celebration. And I don't care if it's like, you know, you're just having a smoothie, like, 
treat yourself, like sit down, create some ambiance. Like this should be a really peaceful place. And, and, mm. and, um, you know, tr- to have a moment to be mindful and almost be thankful. Like it's such a luxury. A lot of people don't have, you know, a lot of money to have nice food. Like if you can sit down and have a nice meal, that's such a, a blessing and a gift and just taking a moment to be really grateful and, and have gratitude to yeah. chew your food. You know, I used to eat so fast because it was such a shameful, I don't want anyone to see me, look at me, you know, mm. especially I tell this to people, let's say you're not eating something healthy. Let's say you're having a pizza or a piece of cake. Yeah. Enjoy it. Okay. It's not part of your diet. Enjoy it. Because I think that there's something that happens in our bodies where if we think it's bad, our bodies are, you know, our brains are so powerful. It's like, okay, well, this is bad. Or, you know, I shouldn't be having this. And then there's all this stress and cortisol running through your body as you're eating this thing, as opposed to being joyous and grateful and just enjoying the moment. Yeah. Uh, I love that. I love that. That totally makes sense. And how do you feel about, I mean, there's a lot of conversation around diet culture and, sure. and all of that, you know, as a, as a wellness professional. Yeah. How do you, what, how do you balance having some kind of a plan where you're like, you know, these are the, these are the types of foods I really want to try my best to eat more of. And these, the, these are the foods that I, I, I want to kind of eat in moderation or all that stuff without it being restrictive and militant and, and really messing you up psychologically. How do you, how do you keep that wiggle room in yeah. your day while also having some kind of a plan for your health? In that yeah. Way? I always tell people the best thing to do is, you know, if, if we can eating things that are not in packages, I think is a really big life-changing thing because then it allows for intuitive eating where we can eat things that are, you know, we, when we're full or if we want to have a snack, we can, it, I think where we get into trouble is when people have packaged foods or things that are processed, you know, you're dealing with companies that are creating products that are, you know, they're test, they're creating, uh, when you eat it, it hits the bliss point. So how do you have intuitive eating if they're designing it for you to not want to eat if you're like hooked on it or if it yeah. has yeah sugar or if it has high fructose corn syrup, which turns off your satiety hormone and never makes you feel full. So you could eat and eat and eat and eat. And never oh, feel full. Is that, oh, is yes. that why? Oh, oh yeah. So anything with high oh, fructose corn means. syrup, because you'll see clients that I worked with. And sometimes, you know, people get very overweight and they're like, I can't stop. I never feel satiated. And it's because a lot of times anything that's super processed with high fructose corn syrup literally shuts off those hormones that makes you feel um, uh, sated. And so you could eat and eat and eat, never feel full. So it's not fair to say like, well, intuitively eat a hamburger and like from McDonald's and you'll stop. Well, if there's stuff in it that turns off that hormone, you know, it's not fair to you. You'll never be able to intuitively eat. So Mm -hmm. I always tell people, you know, if you can eat whole foods, unprocessed foods, things that don't come in packages, intuitive eating will become a lot easier, uh, Mm -hmm. which allows for you to just kind of, you know, have more balance in your diet, you know, we're when we're having fiber and things that have protein, whether it's plant-based or, 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 um, not, it just kind of gives you a little more control over your body. And so did that answer that question? I feel like, yeah, no, definitely. I think, I think having something where you, it's a, it's a simple tip to just say, Hey, you don't have to write every single thing down or you don't have to limit, you know, how many pieces of cake you have a month. But if you just try your try to sway one direction over the other, it's going to kind of just organically help you eat more nutritionally and stuff like that. Absolutely. You know? and, yeah. and you can also plan for things. So for example, I know like on the weekends, it's like, I don't have a boyfriend, but if I did, I'm like, Oh, we're going to go <laughs> in my mind. Let's say I'm going out on a date or something. Uh, and I'm not at home alone with my dog. <laughs> then I would be like, cool. Like I know Friday night, like I might want to have like a drink or a slice of, like a slice of pizza. Who am I kidding? A whole pizza, whatever. Yeah. With, uh, you know, with a friend or a significant other or a date or whatever. Like I just know throughout the day, I'm going to eat lots of fruits and veggies, drink lots of water. And I know that at night it's party time and I'm going to relax and just have fun. So you can also kind of plan for things. And right. if you don't plan for things and you're like, whoops, uh, you know, I went out late, I had a few drinks and then all of a sudden I had a pint of ice cream. That's okay. Yeah. You have the opportunity the next meal tomorrow to get back on track and 
it doesn't mean restrictive dieting, calculating. It could just means like drink some water the next day, eat some yeah. veggies that have some greens and some, you know, um, healthy gut friendly bacteria in them, you know, things like that. Just, right. I, I always think about adding, not subtracting. So instead, cause yeah. old eating disordered Alex would be like, I can't have this. I can't have this. I can't have this. I like to train people to think I can have this. I can have that. I can add this. I'm going to have a pizza. Cool. I'm going to add some broccoli on top or some arugula, right. or I'm going to add a little protein. Just think about adding right now, as opposed to taking away. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. I, um, I used to, I, I made that shift uh, a while back as well. When it came to like my workaholic tendencies of like, I'm going to add a, a hobby or I'm going to add movement, or I'm going to add, you know, I'm going to start getting massages. And then naturally you just have to cut down on other things because you're making time for, you know, better things for your mental health and physical health and, and overall well being. So I, I love that the, you know, think of it as adding, not subtracting. I would imagine, you know, when it comes to the guidance that you give people who are looking, you know, maybe they're, they're past, uh, they've overcome a lot of their disordered eating and now they're wanting to eat more nutritious foods and things like that. But when I'd imagine the advice is very different, if somebody is very recently out of, let's say under eating, you just, I would imagine you just got to, you got to eat whatever, uh, you can, or like whatever sounds good and not even look at nutritional information. That's what I would imagine. I could be totally wrong, but if the goal is just to have more calories, I would imagine they just got to have whatever they, they can, um, before they can even think about eating more nutritious food versus not what, what would yeah. you say about that? Alex? No, I think, I think that's true. I think it's like mending their relationship with food because I think with yeah. eating disorder, we have this intense fear around certain foods and, and being able to eat those foods and not being like not falling to pieces is totally cool. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, for me, it would be as a nutritionist, I would obviously want to make them like mend their relationship with food and let them have things that they like, but also fill their diet with good things too. Because I think for me, the big aha moment was I, when you have an eating disorder, like for me, I was, you know, some people lose their hair. They're tired all the time because they have no nutrition loading yeah. up their body with some good foods. In addition to, you know, have like letting them have the things they want to have or finding yeah. healthier versions of the things they want to have can help. Uh, yeah. But again, it's such a delicate you know, personalized thing because everybody has different trauma, um, when it comes to eating disorders and trying to figure out what's going to work best for them. Right. Right. Oh, that totally, totally makes sense. And it's so interesting to hear your background of really struggling with this. And then, you know, there's, there's a lot of conversation around like how words can be triggering for people with eating disorders, right? Like like words like diet or clean or healthy could trigger some people, but you had an eating disorder and yeah. you don't feel triggered by those things. Um, but I'd imagine maybe that that's not the same for everybody, just like weighing your macros or something made you eat more and feel yes. better versus so it could really send somebody spiraling. Can, do you have anything to say just around the language? Um, cause I'm always so scared to say anything about this because yeah. I never want anybody to feel triggered, but it's kind of impossible because everybody's so different. I don't know. Can you just say anything about the language that we use when it comes to our bodies and food and all of that? If you have anything to share? No, I think that's a really beautiful question. Um, yeah, I, uh, diet for me is very triggering. Um, mm. It, for me, I try to be mindful of saying those things, diet, cleanse, um, oh, yeah. things like that. Anything that's kind of, um, kind of reinforces like restrictive, because I always tell people, at least like for me, this is a lifestyle mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, it's, it's something that we do forever. And I think for me with the binge eating, at least, uh, and the restrictive dieting, I never like was like planning ahead. It was just like, I'm, I have this thing coming up, but I need to look like this in this moment, like in this moment, it's going to heal it. And I never really thought about like the long-term effects of, of what was happening to me, yeah. but yeah, I think it's just replacing those things with, you know, it's just food. It's just a lifestyle. It's, yeah. you know, and, and trying to show people that, yeah, it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a tricky thing because everyone's triggered differently. Yes. Uh, and the last thing we want to do is make anybody feel triggered or upset, but 
Yeah, it's hard not to use those things. But yeah, diet is a big one. I just diet or it, it implies and I honestly, I don't think diets work because it's something that you do for a short right. period of time and then you're back. Diets don't work. It's it's right. really like a lifestyle and 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 planning in, you know, fun and, you know, as at least for me, my diet, my, my, the foods I eat yes. have changed drastically over the years with, you know, my age, how I spend my day, what feels good to me in the moment. And I think a lot of us like hang on for dear life. Like this is how I eat. It's part of my identity. You know, right. I don't eat carbs. I don't eat carbs. Like, and you're like, it's okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like people are like, I'll never eat gluten again. And it's more of like, you know, I think we plant our little flags on the ground and we hold on to dear life and, and it really becomes a part of who we are and our identity and just giving people the permission to try different things and, and experiment and see how our, it feels in our bodies and, and just be open. Um, but yeah. Uh, yes. Do you feel like your relationship with like movement and exercise and all that stuff changed as well? Like when you had your, you, you were struggling with disordered eating, did you move your body or did you <laughs> not like, and then how does that work with your relationship with like, yeah, fitness and exercise? Yeah. Uh, fitness used to be a real punishment. <laughs> fitness uh, used to be like, for me, it's like, I would, Oh my God, I would go to the gym and take like, this is in my twenties. I'd work out at crunch gym and I would take like three class, two classes in a row and then have just a smoothie and then, then I would be able to go out to this thing that I wanted to go to because I was like, so, you know, exhausted and dehydrated. And I was just doing tons of cardio and, uh, you know, I would do workouts that I hated, but it was like, well, Gwyneth Paltrow does this. So, you know, I'm going to do it too. Mm. Now I approach movement so differently where it's like, it's fun and it has to be fun. And if I ever feel like I'm doing it because, you know, I, I ate this or, you know, I have to go this many times a week, then I check in with myself and go like, really, do you really need to do that? Right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, working out, you know, I just, and it's, look, I think it's so important that we move our bodies, but that can look so differently for people. And it's more about feel like the way we feel great. I, I totally, by the way, understand, like, we all want to look good. Like we all want to feel confident in whatever size that is for you, but you know, feeling strong, moving, it feels great. And I think it really does help raise our mood and, and just helps with um, anxiety and stress, at least for me, it's just finding a way where it's a celebration rather than a punishment. Mm, oh, that's so huge. That yeah. is so interesting. I, um, you know, I grew up playing sports and yes. then I, I was on the rowing team in college as well. And you quite literally would get exercise as punishment sometimes. Like if you're like, Hey, y'all, y'all missed, um, 10 baskets in the second quarter or whatever you yes. need to run 10 laps. It very much was exercise as punishment. And so I think that, um, that conditioning, if you, if you grew up like as an athlete or, or playing sports is such a weird mind fucked as, as well. I know yeah. I really struggle with this as become getting older and you know, no longer being part of teams and stuff like that. I had a, such a strange relationship with exercise where it, if it didn't feel horrible and yeah. like punishment and really hard and all of that, that it almost was like, well, this isn't real exercise or what's the point, or this is not going to work. This is not going to help me build muscle or stamina, which is so messed up because, so messed up, yeah. because for me, the way that I exercised around sports, I really did not enjoy. And the way that I exercise now, I really love it. Like it, it, the things that feel good, I was, I was like trying not to do or something, or was telling, talking myself out of doing what I like walks. I like really long walks. I yeah. like just kind of stretching and moving my body, you know? So it's just such a weird thing where, um, you're right. Like, I think we're even conditioned sometimes to view, movement uh, as, as punishment or exercise as punishment too. Yeah. And I think the approach that I've been trying to take with my clients is like, it's, are you having fun? Are you having fun? Right. Like, are you looking forward to going to the gym? Like for me, I started weightlifting. I have, I have so much fun. Like I have really good friends there that have been amazing to me. I, I, so for me, it's a time to like hang out with my girlfriends 
and to, to see how strong I am and, and track my, like, I think it's fun, but for yeah. someone else that might be pole dancing or pickleball or, you know, going for a walk with a friend. And like, I always like help tell people, I'm like, are you having fun? Like ask yourself, are you enjoying this? And it should be the right. same with your food. Like for me, like if I'm cooking a meal and I'm like putting all these things in it and I'm eating it and I feel really good, like it's fun. Like it should be fun. And if it's not fun, then we have to look at it because yeah. These, you know, I think as an adult, a lot of times we have this mindset of like, I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to do this. And these are things that we get to do for ourselves and it should be fun and it should taste good and it should feel good. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So let's say that somebody is tuning in right now and they're really struggling. They've realized over the course of this episode that yeah. they haven't, they have an issue with some disordered eating of some kind what would you like to say to that person tuning in? I will say you are beautiful and you are perfect and you need to love yourself and it's okay. It's going to be okay. And it, it might be, you know, I think the first thing that I did is I started talking to people about it. And then I was able to reach out to others and get the help that I needed, whether that was through therapy or I worked with a dietitian when I was in nutrition school and I had my own private coach and we were able to kind of unpack those things, but you do not have to do this alone. You are not alone and people love you and want to help you. Yeah. So there's that. that. Oh, I love it. (laughs) (laughs) Tear it up. Um, is there, is there anything that we did not cover today, um, that you would really like to mention? Mm, I mean, no, I feel like we just, we really got in there. We really yeah. got in there. We, we like teared up, point. we <laughs> teared <laughs> up and we talked about something important and life-changing. And I think, I think that's good stuff. Yes. So, yeah. well, thank, thank you seriously for opening up so mm-hmm. much about you know, your story and also just answering a lot of my questions. These are, these are topics that I've been really nervous to touch on because of the fear of saying the wrong thing or mentioning something improperly or whatever. And I think you just have to like show up and do your best. And it's so much better to show up and talk about something like this than to stay silent. Even if, you know, I said something weird or whatever. Right. Like, so, um, thank you for like being that person, uh, with me today, like doing this stuff and where can people find you and your work and all of that? Yeah. You can find me on Instagram at eat cute, uh, or you can find me on, uh, the internet at eatcute.com. Beautiful. Awesome. Well, thanks Alex. Really appreciate it. Yay. Thanks for having me. Wow. Thank you so much again, Alex, for coming on the podcast today. I felt like that was a very powerful conversation. I'll be honest, I was a little bit nervous to have it because I know how triggering this topic can be. Um, But I felt like it was important to shed light on it and also provide people with some comfort and and resources and and information. Um, So definitely go check out Alex at eatcute.com. She's got tons of free resources too. I mean, recipes, travel tips, lots of free information over there. So yeah, she is really a, a wealth of knowledge. And we do have an iTunes review of the episode. This is from Jay's Face on a New Race. I hope I said that correctly. Jay's Face on a New Race. And it has five cookie emojis and says, I'm late to the game, but I'm here to stay. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time to leave us a review. If you'd like to leave us a review on iTunes, it might get read on the next episode. Um, we really, really appreciate it. Helps us, um, you know, reach more people, you know, whatever kind of algorithm stuff happening on iTunes that helps other people find the show and find information that could be very deeply valuable to them. And I do want to share some information with you as well. If you or a loved one is struggling with an eating disorder, you can visit nationaleatingdisorders.org. They have an online chat that is available to you. They also have a phone number 1-800-931-2237. You can also text them 800 931 
2237, and they have a crisis text line. You can text um, NEDA to 741-741, and their crisis text line is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so please reach out if you or someone you love is in need of support. Thank you so much for tuning in today, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you so much for listening to the Self Helpless Podcast. You can find our Patreon community, merch, and our individual work at selfhelplesspodcast.com. We'd be thrilled if you shared this episode with a friend or feel free to post it on Instagram and tag at selfhelplesspodcast so we can repost you and say thank you. Yeah.